This is spinach. Nice as a salad or on a sandwich, but otherwise uninteresting. And this is spinach after you remove all the cells in a process aptly named decellularization. What's left after the cells are removed is a ghostly scaffold of mainly cellulose and lignin, ready to have new cells put in. Speaking of which, inside this flask is living rat cells that we grew in our meat incubator that are ready to turn this ghostly scaffold into living meat. Now, you might be asking at this point, why are we doing this? Why make a meat leaf? Well, it's not to piss off the vegans by making a 100% meat-based salad, though I suppose you could do that. The base concept may seem pretty familiar if you've been watching this channel for a while. A few years ago, we did basically the same thing and turned a grape into a meat berry. The idea originally was to demonstrate this incredible technique, because when idiots like myself aren't making meat fruit, the same basic method is being used to make the next generation of replacement organs for patients in need. But to understand how, let me grab something from my oddities table. This is a decellularized pig heart. If instead of berries and leaves, you do the same procedure to a heart like this one, you make the ideal substrate to grow a patient a heart of their own. All you need is a tissue sample from a patient, and it's theoretically possible to grow enough of their own cells outside of their body to refill this heart and make it beat once more. And there are several groups and companies who've managed it successfully, though none have gotten to the point of implanting it into a human. But here's where it gets weird and we get to the topic of today's video. Cells are like little nanorobots, mainly in the sense that they just follow their built-in instructions to the best of their ability. If you put them into a scaffold made of cellulose, they'll grow just as happily as if you were to use a scaffold that was once a pig heart, and they'll slowly convert that scaffold into a facsimile of the tissue type they originate from. Now for the real mad science. If you think of cells as different living inks that will shape a scaffold to have a set of properties, you can take these plant scaffolds and start making designer structures, tissues, and maybe even meat-based robots. For example, if you use bone cells, you can mineralize the scaffold to form a hard, bone-like structure. If you use muscle cells or cardiac cells, you can grow actuators that either you could control or will move rhythmically on their own. If you use connective tissue cells, you can make flexible, tendon-like material. Could you then assemble those pieces into composites that do things? If you use the right cells, could you make kale lungs? Are little Frankenstein jellyfish made out of the contents of a vegetable platter possible? I don't know. The field of tissue recellularization and bioprinting is still incredibly new, so while lots of groups have made a lot of very interesting demos and proofs of concept, no one really knows how far this technology can go. For all we know, it's possible to make a real-life version of Carnivore from Love, Death, and Robots, if only you're clever enough and build up enough of the infrastructure and know-how. So what I propose is, we should find out. Starting today, let's see how easy or difficult the cutting edge of bioengineering really is. While the tech tree up to carnivore is probably a whole lot more steps, the road to vegetable fish is probably a lot shorter. Making something that just swims around in growth media doesn't seem that difficult. If we set that as our first big goal, what would it take to get there? Well, step one would be the ability to grow animal cells, which thanks to the meat incubator we built in a previous video, we can. When we want to use it, all we need to do is pick and buy the cells we want from a catalog along with the right growth media. The next step in the tree is today's video, recellularization. While the meat berry was a great proof of concept, the technique really needed improvement. This time, we're going to use our massively improved biolab to give it a proper go and make a nice, high-quality meat leaf. We'll be using fibroblasts because they're one of the easiest cells to grow and lets us practice the basic technique. They're also a connective tissue cell that exudes an extracellular matrix that makes an ideal home for other cells, so are a good base. We'll test the decellularizing process, then grow and meatify a leaf. But this time, we'll use our fluorescent microscope to check on the cells and make sure our meat leaf really is alive and healthy. As last time, it was a little bit hard to tell with the dyes we had available and because the grape was so mushy. Next time, we can try other cell lines to see if we can really modify the properties of the scaffold. I think bone cells will probably be next to see if we can mineralize the scaffold and make the literal backbone of our vegetable fish. After that, we can get to muscles and motion, and then we just need to assemble the pieces. If it swims around, I'd say we're doing pretty well, and from there, who knows? Considering that our neuron project is running in parallel to all this madness, I think we may also get a chance to see some of the interesting ways that these projects might overlap. So, let's get to it and start the process of making all the vegetarians deeply uncomfortable. First off, there's a lot of pesky cells still left in all these leaves that I bought, so we're going to need to get rid of those. In the literature, there's two ways to do this, perfusion and soaking. We tried both, but you'll see that they each have their pros and cons. Perfusion involves sticking a needle into the end of the leaf and then supergluing it into place. Then the cannulated leaf is pumped with a series of solutions to progressively open up the vasculature, wash away the cells, and bleach whatever remains. 
Soaking is the same basic idea, but just letting the leaves soak in the solutions instead of pumping them through. Theoretically, perfusion is nice because you would have a scaffold with a helpful fluid port built in after the process is complete, making it really easy to seed it with new cells. But trying to force liquid through a leaf without either it or the plumbing exploding is no easy task. Oh, oh, ah, oh, fuck. Bah, fuck. No, oh, fuck. Oh, shit, shit, fuck. After a few days of this and a whole lot of failures, we decided it would probably be easier to just do the soaking method. We only ever got one leaf to go fully clear with perfusion because they kept blowing leaks. One thing I should mention first though is what we'll actually be growing the meat leaf in. Cell culture requires a vessel to hold all the liquid media and act as a place for the cells to live. And normally we use plastic tissue culture flasks and plates. And normally they come pre-coated so that the cells will easily stick to the plastic. For our purposes, we want to maximize the number of cells that actually stick to the leaf and migrate into it, so we bought special dishes that are non-stick coated. But there's a problem, their size. Even the smallest spinach leaf wouldn't fit into one of the wells, so we had to run out and buy some assorted herbs to use instead. I did end up ripping up a spinach leaf so that we could fit it into one of the wells later though, just so we had it as a reference. To get this process started, we picked some leaves that would fit into the wells, choosing only the nicest, undamaged leaves. In the end, mint and cilantro were the two that fit nicely and had enough nice leaves. Now we need to remove the waxy cuticle that coats the outside of the leaf. To do that, the paper we're following suggested dunking the leaves alternately back and forth between a non-polar solvent, here we chose acetone, and a solution of phosphate buffered saline. Honestly, I think this probably caused more damage than just letting the leaves soak in the solvent longer, but we did three cycles of carefully fishing out the delicate leaves and transferring them back and forth between the beakers, letting them sit for a minute between cycles. After that, we're on to our first soap washing. I went with a 2% solution of SDS, also known as sodium dodecyl sulfate, sometimes called sodium laurel sulfate. It's a common soap used in a lot of commercial products. The idea is that cells are basically tiny oil bubbles with protein inside. If you pop the bubble, all the content will wash away easily, and the best thing for getting rid of oil is soap. Plant cells have a double-layered shell, first of cellulose on the outside, then oil and protein on the inside. The soap can't dissolve the cellulose, so it's what's left behind. I put the beaker of leaves on my orbital shaker to keep the liquid gently mixing. I can't use a stir bar here because it would have just blended the very delicate scaffolds. For the next three days, every morning I would carefully change the soap solution and watch as the leaves slowly turned brown and translucent. If at this point I put the leaves on top of some text, it becomes obvious how clear the leaves are. You can see right through and read the text behind them, but there's still this brown tint to deal with. Since we're using leaves, there's a lot of natural plant dyes that will stain the cellulose, so to get rid of those, we're going to be using a bleach solution. This is made of 10% household bleach and 0.2% Triton X100, which is another type of industrial soap. Within a few minutes, the scaffolds have already started turning white, and by the next morning, they've gone clear as glass. Now when we put them on the text, it's hard to even see the leaf. I know this wasn't the point of the video, but it is still very cool to see plants be this transparent. And evidently, it is much easier to make leaves go clearer than wood. To get rid of the excess bleach, the leaves were washed several times with phosphate buffered saline. Then the liquid was drained, and 99% ethanol was added to sterilize the leaves and preserve them until we needed them. But with that, the scaffolds are done and ready to accept new cells. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be using fibroblasts. In preparation for this project, I ordered some fresh cells and got them growing in a T75 flask. The flask at maximum capacity will hold about 8 million cells. When the flask was fully grown, it was time to seed the scaffolds. As usual, all this work is being done in our flow hood so that we have a clean, sterile environment. These cells lack an immune system, so if anything got into the cultures, they would rapidly die. Everything is sprayed with alcohol before loading it into the hood, and there's a particular way to handle everything that keeps the cultures clean. First off, we need to get the scaffolds ready for cells, so I carefully fished out one leaf at a time, picking only the flattest and best, and putting one in each well of our special non-stick plate. The cells are still soaked in alcohol and have actually hardened slightly and curled, but that'll change once they get wet. Speaking of which, I flooded each well with 3 milliliters of HBSS, which is a fancy kind of saline. I let the leaves soak for 20 minutes before draining off the saline. This was then replaced with growth media. This medium, called DMEM, contains everything that the cells need to grow and thrive, and is buffered to hold the pH at a range that the cells prefer. It's supplemented with fetal bovine serum, or as I like to call it, baby cow juice, which is exactly what it sounds like. This contains a large number of growth factors that trick the cells into thinking they're still in a body and dramatically improves their growth. 
I let the leaves soak in growth media for another 20 minutes before changing it out for fresh media. The idea is I'm trying to make sure the leaves are as suffused with media as possible and remove any traces of alcohol which could damage the cells. This time, rather than just letting the dish sit in the hood, I put it into the meat cubator for 20 minutes to equalize. The meat cubator is actually called a humidified CO2 incubator, and it fills its inner atmosphere with 5% CO2. The idea is that the CO2 will diffuse into the liquid and help hold the pH at the correct level. By letting the plate sit in here for a while, the media in the wells will be at the perfect level for the cells when we add them. Speaking of which, at this point, all the cells we need are very much stuck to the bottom of the flask I grew them in, so we're going to need to make them let go so we can collect and use them. This is done by first removing the growth media, and then rinsing the cells with saline. Once they're clean, I add a solution of trypsin, which is an enzyme that will gently break the connections the cells have formed and make them let go. It takes a few minutes, but eventually the cells are all nice and floaty and ready to be collected. I transfer all the liquid to a 50ml tube, and then add 10ml of fresh growth media on top to turn off the trypsin. Then, I spin the tube in my centrifuge to collect all the cells at the bottom. The media is then removed and replaced with 6 milliliters of fresh media, and the cells are gently resuspended. After fetching the plate of leaves out of the meat cubator, I removed 1 milliliter from each well, and then replaced it with 1 milliliter of cell suspension. At this point, the cells are just floating around in and amongst the leaves, so we pop the plate back into the incubator overnight for the cells to grow and attach. Now, since the cells tend to flatten out when they're healthy and are actually pretty hard to see even when they're on plastic, we're going to need to stain them to see them. That way, we'll know if they've adhered and if we have a proper meat leaf. So the next day, I changed out the media for one called OptiMem, which is a serum-free media. The stain we're going to use is called Calcine AM. It's a green fluorescent stain, but it starts as a non-fluorescent clear liquid. The idea is that if a cell is healthy, it'll uptake the dye and then through enzymatic action, cleave part of the dye off, converting it into a fluorescent state. If the cells are dead, nothing will happen, so they won't glow. So not only will this show us the cells, it's also an indicator of how healthy they are. I add 7.5 microliters of stain to each well and then let the plate sit in the meat incubator for 30 minutes to give the cells enough time to uptake and process the dye. Then I very carefully fished out the leaves and transferred them to a microscope slide for observation. As soon as the slide was in view, it was obvious that this had worked absolutely perfectly. An enormous number of cells can be seen clinging to every surface of the leaf. They seem to really like the edges of things, like the ridge of the vein of a leaf, or the very edge of the leaf, but we're just as happy to flatten out and stick to the surface. Just for comparison, here's cells grown normally on a flat surface. See how they're all basically in focus and flat? Compare that to the meat leaf, where even the shape of the cells is a little bit different as they contour to the shape of the cellulose. And for those wondering, this is what a blank leaf looked like. A very, very slight glow, but nothing compared to the meat leaf. There was also some noticeable differences based on which type of leaf we're looking at. The mint is heavily textured, so it's hard to get things in focus, but the cells grow happily in the ridges and valleys. The cilantro was probably the easiest to see the cells since it was so nice and flat, and again, the cells loved it and adhered beautifully. You can even see the leaf texture in some places. Finally, the spinach was really cool because if you zoom in, you can see the stomata of the leaves, or at least the remains of them, in and amongst the glowing fibroblasts. And really, that's about as successful as this project could have been. The method works great, the decellularized leaves are perfect, and the cells stick to them without issue. The staining worked, and it was easy to keep the leaves sterile even with the amount of handling we did. It's nice when a project comes together like this, and it really set the stage for future attempts. But to see all of that, our Neuron Project, and all the other ridiculous things we have planned for the rest of the year, you're going to want to subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss them. And of course, there's links to everything I talked about below in the description. Now, there's just one thing left to do. And of course, that's to thank our amazing patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi that make these videos possible. If you'd like to support the show and help us feed our monstrosities, there's some links below. That's all for now, and we'll see you next time.